Yo, everybody. Welcome to the Friday Christian Masculinism podcast. I am joined by my friends, Will, Nick, and Mike, to review on its debut day, a review of a debut, the film Cabrini, which I've had a look at. And it's terrible. And we want to tell you all sorts of uh, terrors about this thing. And that's what today's show is going to be. At the very least, we're going to review the trailers. And I'll tell you some of what I saw the first 25 minutes, after which I turned this turd off. It's anti-man. It's really appears to be anti-white because there's all kinds of victimization of, of brown people. And <laughs> it's really anti-man. Did I mention that? It's a feminist film made evidently by and for boomers. We'll get into that. But first, I want to say, go to on YouTube if you're looking for the hot new thing, the hot new channel, the Christian Masculinism podcast. We just opened it up so that we're not having to float channels from from mine to, to Nick's to Will's to Mike's. Go to CMask and subscribe. Click the notification bell there. We just hit a thousand subscribers. It's it's basically brand new, and we're now putting our shows up there, almost exclusively. Not exclusively because this is also running on uh, the Rules for Retrogrades channel, but it's it's really important. We're we're up and running now as an independent podcast. How are you, Nick, and then Mike, and then Will? How are you guys doing? Are you ready to go see this film, girls? Yes, so excited guys night out um <laughs> it should be guys night out all, all all three of you um mike and will you included have have at least seen one of the trailers for cabrini right yeah um first of all she's very racially ambiguous i'm italian and i don't know where that <laughs> accent comes from and i don't even know who mother cabrini is so we're starting off on a good footing already <laughs> <laughs> but what about you well she's actually of all of us, we should we should have done that as like a sweepstakes or something. Who who does the actrix who played Mother Cabrini look the most like? It should actually be Will because she's a British woman, just like Will is a British woman. <laughs> <laughs> what well, look, what I, did you think of the trailer, Will? I Will's. did my homework. I watched the trailer. I was blissfully unaware that this thing was being released. Now I feel like I wish I didn't know about it, having seen the trailer. <laughs> uh, I'd, I'd never heard of her before either, so I need to be informed. I want to hear more about these 25 minutes that you've seen, Tim, and that you've had to switch off afterwards. Well, the director is Alexander Monteverde, and the thing is put out by Angel Studios, who also made Sound of Freedom. They released this movie on the International Socialists' International Women's Day, which is today. We probably needed to pause and celebrate Oof. this for a little bit, that it's Moment International Women's Day. Yeah, I, I feel a little silly now that I haven't done so. But they they said they wanted to release it on the International Socialists' International Women's Day. I'm, I'm going to play you guys the, the trailer, at least the audio for the trailer in a second. <laughs> but I just want to make it really clear. We're, we're, we're joking around and having our tongues planted in our cheeks here. But it's real. The director in an in interview with National Catholic Register, who sh shouldn't be celebrating any of this, said this was a great feminist screenplay that was handed to him by so-and-so. And he was just so excited to make it. Before, can, can I just get a quick comment from, from you, Will? What, why in 2024 are we still as faithful Catholics, as right of center assumed national catholic reporter catholics talking as if it's 1992 or 1988 and and feminism is something that's acceptable are these guys just boomers or what why why would he approach the topic with such a lack of caution because it's the tripwire if he steps over it then things go boom his reputation will go boom his bank account as well might get seized, he might lose his job. He's been a good boy in saying the things that he's supposed to say about this mind-blowing masterpiece. Miracle of a film. Miracle of a film. It, yes, as it's been reviewed by a couple of boomers. I think that was Glenn Beck. What, what do you say, Mike? Um, It's just a sign. It's just another symptom of how 
feminism and its tentacles has just infiltrated the church and the faith. Um, these guys are disconnected from reality, and I wouldn't even call them proper Catholics or believers. They're spiritually gay for pay, and somebody that's spiritually gay for pay um, can't call themselves a real follower of Jesus. I'm, I'm not surprised. That's why I don't really have a reaction for it. I still don't know who Mother Cabrini is. So <laughs> <laughs> She is actually a saint. She's a saint. She is. Cool. She's she's a saint. Um, you might not know from watching the the trailer. She's she's not an Indian. That that accent is really muddled, Nick. Um, she because <laughs> it's a British woman who looks vaguely sort of Italian. You got a couple Paisani here in in me and Mike, and she looked. I mean, she's she's browner than either me or Mike. But she the first scene she hits and she's like, "Welcome to the Quickie Mart." Like I, I don't think she's doing the right accent. I'm like, a woman and I am Italian. You're like, where, where yeah. Russian, well, British, Indian. <laughs> yeah. Tim, you and I saw this trailer like in July, August of last year. At when Sound we, of Freedom. When we went to go see Sound of Freedom, we're sitting down, you know, we're getting ready to see this grassroots film. Um, I was unfamiliar with Angel Studios, and they're already debuting the trailer for this next film, Cabrini, which means they were probably close to done shooting it and already in the edit. And you and I just like looked over at each other, like horrified at several points in the trailer going like, there's no way, there's no way. Oh, no. Like, we're about to watch a film from the studio, and this is like the film that's coming out. Like, there's no way. And then this trailer, that I don't know if it's the one that you pulled, Tim, but at the end, um, there was some Twitter campaign or something that they did where they were like intercutting people's reactions to Mother Cabrini with with the trailer itself, and it's just funny to see like these these beta men, these beta boomer men, and then these like young kind of neurotic looking catholic women being like it's just so feminist i just love how strong it makes women look and to me that's absolutely emblematic of modern catholicism tim specifically what you will and i deal with with like the matchmaking culture and stuff like this like this is what young catholics are like it, it's almost smart that they marketed it like this because every young catholic woman is going to drag her poor young Catholic boyfriend to go watch this movie. And he's going to have to go the whole time. Like, bro, I told you, I told you Catholic women are strong. Like I told you, bro. Like, yeah, I think you're like mother Cabrini, bro. No, for sure. <laughs> well, Nick, Nick, you're basically making a MGTOW argument. You sound like a MGTOW guy. You're like, they're going to get dragged to it. They have to say this or else. And, and well, MGTOW is like, yeah, they're, just don't they're get going to the young. Well, yeah, but the young beta Catholic guys are going to like, this is here's, here's the yeah. first, Here's the first test that every young Catholic guy can pass. Yeah. Whether they're single or they're in a relationship, openly express your disdain. Disdain for this trailer. And and just let everyone know immediately, man, this film looks terrible. I'm not going to go see it. It looks so feminist. This is really counter biblical. This is against my faith. They're making a mockery of the Catholic Church and just see what happens. If your girlfriend freaks out, if your girlfriend's parents freak out, if your parents freak out, now you know. Congrats. Dumper. I, Dumper. <laughs> I can guarantee you that uh, Papa Francesco, Papa Fra uh, Pope Francis loves this film. He's probably going to he's probably going to endorse it. Because he, he wants to smasculizare the church. So, I was just going to say that was the word that came to mind. Smasculizare. Come on, dude. Oh. Um, Nick, I just I'll just say this, that when you watch movies with Nick, He's like an escaped Nazi from a Venezuelan <laughs> prison. And so because he's a director, so I I'm always worried if I'm breathing too loud. My kids are always being too loud if we watch a movie at his house. But you're, I'm always worried. So when we we're starting up Sound of Freedom, I was like, this is this is the trailers. Is it OK if I eat a bite of popcorn? Will that be too loud? Will he strike me or oppress me <laughs> the, the way that escaped Nazis do? And so I'm also I'm also the kind of guy, obviously, I'm sort of a loud mouth. So I'm always jabbing people quietly in the ribs if something funny happens during a movie. So I was expecting to be persecuted. But this was just the previews. And I I was looking at him and he was already looking at me when we saw that this was Angel Studios 
before we went to see whatever it was last summer, Sound of Freedom. So I was like, this is bad. This is really bad. Why would anyone do this? And at the um, trailer that I'm going to play for everyone out there right now is I think trailer number one, the one that we saw, but like Nick said, they had edited in responses of Catholic NPCs. It, you know, they're like, this is great. It's so powerful. Um, the, the, okay, the craziest so here, thing about it, right, is that it's not that women are supposed to watch it and learn how to be a strong woman. Young guys, the guys Nick's describing, they're being dragged to it. They're supposed to watch Mother Cabrini and learn from her how to be a strong man. She yeah. models manhood to them. This yes. is what it's all about. Yes. That, yes, because the only thing that great. Mother Cabrini is doing in the entire trailer is reprimanding men in authority for not not seeing her vision, not seeing how extraordinary, extraordinary she By is. By being a rebellious pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, literally, if you think Mike, who admitted that he doesn't know who Mother Cabrini is or hasn't seen the film, is wrong then you're the wrong one out there. Uh, parish orphans and or retrogrades and or sea mask purveyors of all kind because this is exactly what the first 25 minutes was. Let me just play the trailer. Uh, Will, there's so many good points here. I wanted to talk about Will's point, but we'll, we'll, we'll table that for afterwards. In fact, girls aren't going to go out there and become nuns because of this young English, Russian, uh, Indian <laughs> woman playing <laughs> Mother Cabrini. They're, they're, they're probably going to do nothing. They're just getting psyched up and they're like seeing by being insufferable, by being rebellious and acting unfeminine, I can do that in my married life. They're not going to go get a vocation because of it. This is why exception makes bad law. And, and, and it's just going to it's just signaling to men that they should stand down like the Minneapolis police force. Right. That's that's all that's happening here. So here is trailer one. You're going to hear the mellifluous sound of Shania Twain saying, let's go girls right at the beginning. Cause that's what kind of film this is. This is the kind of pandering these clowns at angel are engaging in here. It goes. Tell me if you can hear this. Tell me if you can't hear this rally. We are to build an empire of hope. Let's go girls. It seems we must first conquer New York. Come on. Do people know? Rats have it better than the children of five points. Okay, hold on. J sorry, I have to pause. In the the video for this thing, wow. it says she knew her place. In the first 25 minutes, this line keeps coming up. Do you need to know your place? This is just, it's like feminist agit prop. This is agitation propaganda. And um, they're, they're talking about brown people as well, but they're mainly trying to agitate women. She knew her place. I'm going back. Before women could own property, uh, in, in the kind of title card or whatever, then it flashes to a few more scenes and it goes, she knew her place. I'll go back. Yeah, I want to scream and shout. Her place. We have to show America we are all people of dignity. Be careful, America. This place will lead you alive. We have swatted a hornet's nest. We are bold or we die. It's not safe. Not for you. I should be back. It's, it's not safe, not for you. This is from one of the early scenes that I did catch in the actual film. The Pope is telling her, look, you, you need to accept your charge. You've taken a vow of obedience. You need to not be pushing. And she's pushing and pushing and pushing. We'll talk about what happens in the scenes I did see a little more. But um, you need to know your place. They keep using this as like a trope. It's, it's, like, a, it's like a bad propaganda film um, where they're using expressions that were created. It's like the way we never were. Feminists created this certain expressions, you know, like you're either with us or against us. They made that one up about the Iraq war. Um, maybe one person said that, maybe Bush said that. But this one is like, you need to know your place. Like no even legitimate misogynist has ever said that. But leftists started saying that men say that. People who hate men say men say that. And the fact that they're glomming onto that and they use it, I think multiple times in like the first minutes of the movie 
tells you everything you need to know about this little turd nugget. I will speak to the mayor, signore. Who the hell do you think you are? Man, I feel like a woman. Yes. If you think you're going to march in here and help me... I want the best hospital for your people and for mine. Begin the mission, and the means will come. What kind of New York do we want? Yes, I guess. Are we not? We are. What if I want to bump the school for a little woman, you make a lot of noise, is what the Pope just told her. That's a good thing. Boys, respond. Nick, you respond first. I I'm waiting for you to say one particular thing. And we'll go Nick, uh, Will, Mike. I try to snake back and forth. In here. Well, I'm curious if I'll say the one thing. I don't know. What I was thinking this whole time is because of the noise gating, we were, we were just hearing primarily the whatever words they chose to use in the trailer. And when you cut a trailer, which... Believe it or not, I, I enjoy cutting trailers more than I like cutting films. Um, there's just they're more bite sized, they're more interesting. Um, but what you do is you go through the entire film, everything that's been said, and you find the things that are most interesting and most thematic so that when somebody watches the trailer, they know what they're gonna watch in the movie. So the fact that we were only hearing that those decisions that were made says obviously a significant amount about the movie. And it's just appalling. Never, also never in a trillion years would I have chosen that song for a period piece. Yeah. That's it's really odd. bad. They yes, didn't even like adapt it. Like they didn't adapt it to whatever 1800s, 1900s thing. Like that was because a girl, it's girl power, bro. As a Canadian, Shania Twain. Cool. That's awesome. But how the hell does that make any sense? I thought you were joking, Tim, when you said uh, Shania Twain's song was attached to this, the film but that's actually real it's real. as if it, this could get dumber and more skittles like it just got more skittles like so it did, it did. we're this is the reason why um the catholic church is losing so many men to islam and eastern orthodoxy yeah cabrini yeah it's it's stuff like this dude we're not they're not making a good case for our faith at all and then you combine that with Pope Francis and all the guys are like looking from the outside in that don't want to actually study it or like, yeah, I don't want any part of this joke. And like, can right. you really blame them? And the worst thing about it, I haven't seen the film. I'm not going to either. The The worst thing about it is that it might even be disrespectful to the actual real life mother Cabrini as well. It like, is. What, what, it yeah, is. But, yeah, because what they are, I bet they're going to downplay. I'm just looking at the uh, Wikipedia entry for her here. So she restored the sight of a day old baby who'd been blinded by 50% silver nitrate solution instead of the normal 1% solution. So baby's sight is restored. And to me, that's a big thing to make a big deal of rather than what I'm hearing in this trailer is the things that truly make her great. So where our focus is being drawn, it's not a problem with her. It's a problem with the directors who are trying to turn her life story into feminist propaganda. That's what we're talking about here. Well said, Will. She had a devotion to the Sacred Heart. Um, my understanding is they didn't touch that, touch on that in the film at all. Right. And that's, Tim, you and I were talking a night or two ago about how I'd love to someday do an adaptation or a, a, a biopic of Annalise Michelle, a.k.a. Emily Rose, to Catholics who have seen the exorcism of Emily Rose. I haven't seen it. I don't like those kinds of films. But um, I do know that the entire genre of possession films, they just glorify Satan. They do very little, to, if anything, to glorify God. And this Cabrini seems to be falling uh, prey to the same sort of spirit, which is you're glorifying a woman and her rebellion, a.k.a. non-Serbium, which is Luciferian, as we've discussed before uh, on this show, you're glorifying that. A rebellious woman, the, like the least Christian expression of femininity you could possibly have, and ignoring her devotion to the Sacred Heart, like this is evil. There's can also a guarantee that... Uh, the real Mother Cabrini wasn't nearly as insufferable as this actress. And <laughs> of course, she was the same. Mother... Yeah, the saints, like... yeah, they weren't insufferable. They they were obedient. Saints were obedient. 
That's particularly women saints who are charged with being doubly obedient, Mike. Yeah, that's how I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm not surprised by it at all, but the, I'm kind of, the more I kind of think about it, and Will, you brought up a good point, the more I'm kind of disgusted by it, instead of depicting like you know, the, these women of the faith as they were righteous, virtuous, obedient women, um, submissive to God and the men around them, instead they're making them look like these boss babe insufferable bitches that exist now. It's 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 anger inducing. It's well, angry. it's it's because the people always get frustrated that there's the same cardinal virtues for for men and for women. Like guys will ask this. I just want to know what really makes me a man, but I just see the same cardinal virtues for men and for women. That's true, but the way that the two sexes um inflect or like refract the virtues looks different. So a male saint looks different. There's a different aura of holiness compared to a female saint. And what they're doing here is like refracting what should be female sainthood, but through a, a male lens of being like a go-getter, being strong, being loud. And it's because they actually hate what female sainthood looks like. Yeah, <laughs> which is poverty, chastity, and obedience in silence. You know, and we're called misogynists or whatever when we actually care and th three of us, Nick, maybe this is in your future, have daughters. I care very much about the preservation of true femininity, true godly femininity. So when I see a, a woman depicted like a man, that was very much a woman and a godly woman at that, it's there should be more of a, a reaction of visceral disgust because this is, yeah. Yeah, they're the, trying, yeah, go ahead. The Jim. first 25 minutes, I'll say, I'll say a, a little, I'll intersperse it throughout for a real treat for you guys. When it's on the first 25 <laughs> minutes, the model, the exemplar that she must have been using for motivation, it's more like Eve or Lilith, you know, Eve, Eve, Eve sinned. She didn't follow God's law. She didn't follow her husband's lead. And she got caught. Um, of course, as Elizabeth Cady Stanton, the first wave feminist said, Lilith's even better. Apocryphal Lilith from the Tal Talmud. She's even better because she rebelled against God and against man and got away with it. This is like a third archetype. It's a woman who rebels against God and his patriarchal church, particularly the clerics in the church, high clerics. And instead of just getting away with it, she's being extolled for it by the 95 IQ boomer, uh, she principles of Catholic high schools all around America. That's who's going to love this thing. But who didn't love it is a guy I've dealt with a few times. He runs Catholic culture. And this was a breath of fresh air. It, it lowered my blood pressure to read. First paragraph. The title is Cabrini secularizes a saint. Thank you. This came up on March the 4th. Thomas V. Miris. After I saw Cabrini... The new biopic of the great missionary saint who served the immigrant poor in New York. I perused some other Catholic reviews of the film and something struck me as odd. You guys respond to this. What struck him as odd. It's what always strikes us as odd. The reviewers seem to admit tacitly or explicitly what I observed in my own viewing. The film contains little about God, prayer, or the Catholic faith in general. Yet strangely, many of these reviewers don't conclude that this is a fatal flaw in a movie about a Catholic saint. Now, I, I would say the same thing. My big charge is it's openly feminist, and it's strange to see in a movie about a saint. But um, you guys respond to that. Well, it's you a first. feminist story. Sorry, sorry. Mike, you first. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, sorry, man. I'm, I don't know. I'm, this gets me so angry. But it's like it's uh, even my wife, she sends me a text message. She's like, oh, this Cabrini movie comes out on International Women's Day. LOL. Of course it does. She even she doesn't buy into the bullshit. Um, all it is is a feminist movie with a Catholic backdrop. Yeah, I, I, you don't even need to see the movie to understand that. So that that guy's review is absolutely on point, and I guarantee you, one out of a hundred reviews, that's like probably the only review of its kind <laughs> that says anything disparaging about the movie. Layla Miller, Layla Miller. This was a breath of fresh air. She got a, a previewing of it. Who who's published books with Trent Horn. Um, Layla's anti-feminist and does does uh, by and large very good work. She, another early breath of fresh air, it was right after I saw it about a month ago. She'd seen it, a review copy. 
And she was like, she said the exact same thing. She's like, this is whatever you just said. This is Catholic scenery for a yeah. very secular feminist movie. And, and another thing she said that, that Thomas Miris is um, remarking, why do Catholics always fall for it? Well, why do Catholics always fall for it, man? I don't know. I'm just thinking it's funny that you could tell the people who made this movie probably you know, any woman's life story, any female saint's life story, and after they listen carefully, they say, okay, so basically like a suffragette, yeah? I think that's the only <laughs> way they can understand any woman. Okay, yeah, so it's a suffragette. And they're going to make the film, they're going to make whatever you say to them. And that's what that reviewer is pointing out. That's the only game they know how to play. And why do people love it so much? I think it comes back to the point I made earlier, that they've been brainwashed, they've been conditioned into lapping this stuff up because the social consequences of going against it are too painful for most people. Most guys would not want to say at the dinner table with the relatives around or the in-laws, whoever it might be, I didn't like that film. Yeah, and I love that it's... it's. I like that they did this, honestly, because it, it's just so easy. It's like the... It's like the um the jabby jab now you could be or like if you wear a mask at the grocery store i can now know you by how you thought about cabrini trailer and if you went to go see it to me it's worse than you going to see the barbie movie and if you say a sentence well my okay but my girlfriend made me or my wife made me it's like it's well, even could, worse i know now even more about you but <laughs> the uh ripperger had a talk a couple of days ago on census fidelium i highly recommend everybody go listen to it and ripperger he doesn't get caught up in the feminism stuff he's actually he's pretty clear-headed on that and because he know yeah. he understands patriarchy and he understands that power to fathers is how you protect people your family spiritually and he was giving a talk about modesty and what modesty actually means through a Thomistic lens and a catholic lens and i'm going to try my best not to butcher what he said, but I recommend everybody just go listen to it on census fidelium. It came out like six days ago, but he, he discusses how modesty can apply, not just to um, behavior regarding the sixth commandment, sexual behavior, but also speech and people who can't stop talking are immodest because they believe their ideas to be far more important or meaningful than they really are. And he even goes further and, and describes contexts in which um, there's hierarchies and authorities in which it would be immodest for you to transgress against. And one of the examples he gave was <clears throat> if uh, a wife were to correct her husband in front of the kids, he's like, that's immodest. That's not how you do it. If the wife has something to say, you wait until the kids are out of the room and then you say it to your husband because that would be immodest. That doesn't conform to the office of wife. And then he also talks about uh, clerics and whether or not a cleric should address a young girl about something regarding sexuality. He's like, no, of course not. A cleric should never address certain things like that. He might address it in marriage counseling, and in which case he would do it very frankly um, and and not salaciously. He would just address the facts of the matter. Um, and then if there's correction of authority, some priests shouldn't correct the authority of bishops or the pope or something in their particular office, because that would be immodest. All of this to say, they're painting Mother Cabrini as immodest. They're making her out to be a sinful woman. She's immodest in this sense. And as we've already said, I'd be shocked if the actual Mother Cabrini was like this. Something tells me she was quite modest and maybe it pained her. Maybe she was in tension with recognizing the good that she wanted to achieve and still trying to remain in submission. But they completely subverted that in this. And, that the, and the plot is like just a guy, basically it's like a guy trying to do a startup company. And everyone's telling you like, your idea sucks, man. Like you'll never make the next b basketball shoe. And he's like, no, it's a swoosh. I'm going to try really hard. Everyone's like, no one's going to wear the swoosh shoe, bro. And he's like, no, it's going to be stylish. And it's two hours of him just fighting for it. And he's like, I made the shoe. And everyone's like, you made the shoe. We believed in you. It's like, that's not... Wait, a saint's wait. life. Pause. Th this this is top quality commentary from Nick because I, I don't think you read this. Let me let you hear 
you, you just said that it's basically trying to make a female on, entrepreneuress. I, as you were saying your swoosh thing, Nick, I am reading the director. Uh, I think it's the director, Alexander Monteverde. It's um, three very, very Spanish names. They're called the Three Amigos that are the Catholics associated with with Angel Studios, uh, the, the, the Trace Amigos. Um, so the question is asked by National Catholic Register. Bear what Nick was just saying in mind. How did you decide to do a film on Mother Cabrini? He responded, this is a movie that found me. I didn't really look for the movie. I have to give all the credit to J. Eustace Wolfington, which sounds like a fake name. Uh, the executive producer who has a big devotion to Mother Cabrini. He is the one who found the film and put it all together. He is one of the most successful entrepreneurs that I know. He created the concept to lease a car. I guess he literally did this. And Mother Cabrini was a very successful entrepreneur. Oh. She built an empire as big as the Rockefellers at that time. And created over 67 institutions all around the world. So when I read this great feminist screenplay, great feminist screenplay, great. So when, hold on, we're in 2024 and we have a guy that's supposedly a faithful Catholic saying, when I read this great feminist screenplay, I... And when I read her life, I realized that this was a movie about a woman that happened to be a man. So you're you're de you're spot on, Nicholas. Wait, that's how it ends. That's how that sentence ends. Uh, I I realized that this was a movie about a woman that happened to be a nun, and she happened to be the first oh. American saint. But the, they said happened to be a man. I was yeah, like, they, I heard too. I was like, they let the quiet part out loud. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's no, but it's, it's also trans. What? <laughs> the the <laughs> emphasis on like the building of an empire is. Staggering. Imagine saying like Mother Teresa built an empire of like feeding children. It's like, are you Bill Gates? Like, is this a C3? Are you getting 20x on your jabby jab investments? Like, it's what are you talking of, about? Of, of, of a saint. That's, that's this is an industry. Yeah. 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 Oh, my goodness. It's well, not, disgusting. Not Bill Gates. The Rockefellers. He literally says she built an empire as big as the Rockefellers at that time. This is what I said. I, I'd like to go back to. Will's point, where um, oh, two things for me. When girls aren't going to go out and become nuns because of this um, Indian, English, Russian <laughs> actrix who badly, badly maimed the the life story in this biopic of Mother Cabrini. They're not going to go become nuns. They're, not, they're probably going to go do nothing aside from be insufferable and yammer on about it over coffee to their beta boyfriends at, you know, at Catholic universities. That's probably what's going to happen this weekend. But if anything, if they take anything from it, well, I think what they're going to take is, um, I, she built an empire as big as the Rockefellers. Now, I don't so much have a vo vocation to the religious life, but I do want to build an empire as big as the Rockefellers. And she was, re man, she didn't know her place, man. She she really that that opening scene where Cabrini tells a bunch of the Vatican prelates at the CDF, they're like, you can't see the Holy Father right now. He's busy. And she like insists and bursts through. She's yelling at him. She's like, why? Because I'm a woman. She says, why? Because I'm a woman about 10 times, it feels like. And then she talks to the Holy Father and he's like, no, you're 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 trying to um, stretch your mandate. Your mandate is this. Go do that. Bloom where you're planted, which sounds like really good advice. In other contexts, in the sound of music, bloom where you're planted, be a submissive woman. And Maria does, so she gets a happy life. In this, she bursts through the door, she bursts through the glass window, and she becomes an entrepreneur. And that's all women are going to take away from it, Well, Yeah, I, I just read that she is uh, informally recognized as an effective intercessor for finding a parking space. So hopefully... We will find parking spaces for all the women who get married just at home with their husbands. And then the women who aren't married will find a parking space outside a convent. <laughs> <laughs> Is that real though? That's real. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Actually though, I thought you were I thought you were joking. No, I no, it's too. real. It's real. Yeah. Did they have cars? 
when was when did Cabrini Cabrini? I think Cabrini uh, in like around let me the try time. Let and find it. Yeah. 19, 1946. Okay. She so was oh, canonized. Nice. And one priest comments here, she lived in New York City. She understands traffic. That's why she's an effective intercessor for finding a parking space. But this film is not about women being content where they're parked in the traditional feminine roles, is it? It's all about breaking the rules, being on the move, being restless. It's not a good message to be sending young women at all. When is this shit going to end? Like, I'm getting so frustrated with this. When we when, end when is When is, like, the just this lukewarm effeminacy that's like anti-scripture too right so yeah when is Mike, it like, i was about to go ahead build on that because i saw a bumper sticker uh, a handful of weeks ago that said well-behaved women rarely make history and a couple, couple of things just a few things women don't make history first of all second of all there's only one i said this before we started the show there's only one catholic female saint that i'm concerned with that any woman in the catholic who is a catholic should be concerned with and that is the mother of jesus that is mary that's it and the well-behaved woman rarely make history comment is luciferian because the highest woman said do whatever he tells you she is the model for femininity and 100%. she served and she deferred to the son of god she never preached she never instructed so it's it's strictly it's anti-marian and it's anti uh christic it's anti-christic to have this spirit of gnom servium that is being presented in in this film like well it's, it's even it's like yeah it's like it's like you know the depiction of baphomet right he's both man and woman that's all they're just trying to do with with women and this is the thing well-behaved women don't make history uh uh who the fuck cares because you were we look at mary and hold her in such a high regard she birthed jesus women all they have to do is exist and they've got this incredible gift of bearing life and giving it like as if why do you need more than that we we regard Mary in the, in the way that she does in the way that she is because she is the mother of Jesus. That's her, the Our Lady, the mother of Jesus. Isn't that not significant enough? And to me, this stuff drives me insane because I, when I think of Cabrini in this whole time period, it reminds me of my great grandmother, and she had a botched surgery when she was very young, and she died in her nineties, and she was like hunchback for the majority of her life, and she birthed. She had she, five children died. She birthed like four or five kids took care of orphans, was a devout Catholic, devout, prayed the rosary daily, watched the mass, fasted the whole bit, wore black for 20, 25 years after her husband passed away, was as submissive and as obedient as a woman could be, the most virtuous woman I've ever known. So when I see stuff like this, I can't help but get angry because I, kn I know what a woman of this time period, that women like that do not exist anymore. And depictions like this are it's it's a complete bastardization and Luciferian depiction of what a woman actually is in God's eyes and his design for women. And so I I, I couldn't help but think about my grandmother and get just super angry because I'm like, I guarantee you, Cabrini was probably much like my grandmother in, in all of those things. Very virtuous woman in her quietness, the silence of her spirit and her actions spoke so loud and she didn't do them for recognition. She did it because that was that was her role. She knew her role, and she blossomed, like you said, Tim, where she was planted. Gets me fired up, man. Let me let me blow your guys' minds. I know I know Nick has strong feelings on this, experiential feelings. Your grandma, Mike, even as a grandma, however old they are, right? They're 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 just they're way older than us. They were the exception to the rule in their day, and the historiography is built on lies none of the boomers, none of the 60 or 65 or 70 year old people are anti-feminist. They're all feminists, mm -hmm. conservatives, liberals, libertarians, whatever. They're all feminists. The generation up from them, like I guess that's greatest gen, 100 year old old ladies are mostly feminists. So your gem of a grandma, I mean, my 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 two grandmas are are gems, I guess, in, in 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 really in specific other ways, but both of them 
are strongly feminist. We've talked about this in the film. My older grandma, who's a hundred, I, I I have both of my grandmas still, um, told me that she could be my boss. And I was like, no, I wouldn't like that. I don't want that. That's against nature. And like my whole family took her side. Everyone got mad at me at dinner. And I was like, sorry, grandma, I don't want you as my boss. Get off my back, grandma. Um, so we've been lied to about the historiography because the more people you share this with, my grandma was a feminist. She just turned 100. Mm. They're like, yeah, me too, man. I was like, okay, so do you, do you know how the maths work? It's 2024. That means that people that were born in 1924 were being hit with this feminist shit long before like 1965 after the country lost its innocence and JFK, all that shit. That's not true. Feminism, the first wave began in 1848. Nick, I know you have strong feelings about that. After that, I want to play for you guys uh, Glenn Beck's fat voice uh, extolling this film. Yeah, that's something that we will be articulating in What a Woman Is, the upcoming doc adapting your book, The Case for Patriarchy, um, of just that fact that there was 75 years of groundwork laid of feminism. And you could argue even a little bit more than that because you don't just get to the first wave of feminism suddenly and overnight. Like you had to get women to march in the women's march. You had to get women to go to these meetings and all sit down. So that there's there was a cohort of women who left their husband's home with or without his permission, probably without, to go sit in a room with other women and conspire hearing uh, this this drivel and agreeing that, yes, we should march, we should organize, we should conscientiously object to our husbands on all of these matters. And eventually, if we do this long and hard enough, then we can get the vote. So that's probably closer to 100 years before the greatest generation that this has taken place. So there's vestiges of it. And, you know, maybe one every 10, one every 50 grandmas and grandfathers that uh, aren't feminists. But the vast majority of this narrative is a lie that in the 1950s, men came home to a submissive wife who had cooked dinner, was happy to see him and asked him how his day was. It's just nonsense. Yeah, maybe the 1850s. But Probably the this... 1850s was like the last... The last time that that was ubiquitous yeah yeah agreed agreed now that's that's what it means for first wave feminism to have begun in 1848 uh, after that it was a post-feminist world and i guess the revelatory thing about what you're saying actually I, I say it too in case for patriarchy is because first wave feminism is the same as second and third and fourth they're, they're a distinction without a difference aside from emphasis that you can't talk about First wave feminism is being the really actually still pre-feminism world. It's just as bad. Now, I'm going to make all you guys mad by playing Glenn Beck, reviewing this miracle of a film. He said, it's a miracle of a film. I compare it to the quality of The Godfather. It's an epic tale, and it is beautiful. Now, The Godfather. He compared it to The Godfather? Yeah. Yeah, he, he said, I... I, I literally, Glenn Beck, I compare it to the quality of the Godfather. <laughs> what a dumb motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. I Compared it to the Godfather, dude. <laughs> this is the most Italian God. reaction I've ever seen. Oh, no. Mike, God. remember you're a Canadian, yeah. all right? Peace, yes, yes. calm. <laughs> I speak Italian, Nick, okay? <laughs> I'm halfway there. Um, what a dumb motherfucker. Oh, my God, right. dude. All right, here, here's Glenn of a film hold on it uh, i compare wait, it to the mike's mike's gonna oh. like go jersey shore on us here we go this film cabrini is uh a, a tremendous film uh it is a, a great story it's well acted john lithgow is in it uh it is it, it is it's a miracle of a film it i compare it to the quality of uh, godfather it is an epic tale and it is beautiful. It is the highest of the art form. If it wasn't, uh, you know, being released, I think, by Angel Studios, uh, it would win Best Picture when it comes out. Oh. It, then, it, then it pans to see, the, the weird thing in the narrative here. Well, I want to get your take on this is. 
so he says like it's so so good it's, it's not i watched the first 25 minutes and i i turned it off it was boring and just nails on a chalkboard feminism not notes of it but it's clubbing you over the head with feminist tropes and it's boring it's just boring it's a bo it's a boring topic let's be honest and they made it secular instead of like oh this is a catholic movie it's not super exciting but this is a if it's well done then it's a biopic that will really draw me toward um the miraculous nature of what the saint was doing not my favorite type of film to watch but it would have been well done it was boring and i turned it off so hearing this goon describe it as a miracle of a film he, he, boomers think the godfather is like the greatest film ever so he's saying it's on par quality wise qcing with the greatest film ever and guess what it's all political it's not going to go far because it's really conservative that's what he's saying and then right after that they flat you couldn't see it they flashed on the screen being released on international uh socialist uh international women's day literally invented by the socialist international woman what are they doing they're dressing it up as a, a kind of anti-hero conservative stick in the mud in in very very radical hollywood but it's very very radical hollywood nick or uh, will what do yeah, the, the Godfather comparison's so misleading because The Godfather is actually a more religious film. I haven't seen anything apart from the trailer, but from what you're saying about the half hour you've seen of this, The Godfather is a far more religious film and deals with ideas about sin and redemption, etc. It gets deeper into the soul of man than this film does, which is basically about immigration, as far as I can tell. It's mainly, its main theme is immigration. And they've just turned it into identity politics. So he's way off base with trying to make a comparison between the two. You know, why is this being pumped out? Comes back to what we said at the start. We've repeated it once already. You don't get mainstream films. Nothing's allowed to go big unless it takes this line. This is what you have to follow. That's why Sound of Freedom also didn't actually name names and they had to invent conspiracy theories about, oh, this film is being suppressed because it it really says the truth. No, no, but it like actually says what's going on. And then you had Jim Caviezel who mentions like adrenochrome on some Zoom interview or something and everyone goes, oh my gosh, this film is going to reveal the seedy underbelly of the world and these elites who traffic children and then you watch it and it's like one sting operation the last third of the movie is a complete fabrication it's it's an invented last third of the movie um, but the primary sting operation was getting like 150 kids rescued from a few human traffickers in some like third world country in south america and it has nothing, to, no names were named. They had zero courage to actually identify the problem. And they had to invent all these conspiracy theories to uh, get boomers to get trapped into going to see it and walk out and feel virtue signaled like they, like they did something, like their emotions, like them recognizing that harming children sexually was uh, some kind of achievement of morality. Congratulations, I have also identified this and I didn't need to see the film. So this is seems to be the MO with Angel Studios is you get and Tim and I just saw Dune and not to open that wound up. I liked it more than he did. But uh, something we both agreed on was that the plot was immensely lacking, but that the technical proficiency was as as high as it could be with a film. You know, it's, it's shot beautifully. And it's funny to hear Glenn Beck say that the quality reminded him of the godfather because if you just in normie's brains if you just fire the right synapses because it like there's a black bar on the top and the bottom of a film and like a light flare comes in the side they're like oh this is literally hollywood this is a good movie it's the same thing as all of the other movies that i've ever seen and it's not it's it's horrible but it does work on like the 70 percent of the bell curve <laughs> or, or it's about it's about what they want to see, which is a woman going around making offers that people can't refuse. Like that's that's what you're supposed to really do. That's that that's the Godfather theme to it. If uh, <laughs> if if Blue Balls was a movie, it'd be called Sound of Freedom.
Yeah, <laughs> which they wouldn't because uh, it would really conflict with the contents, Mike. But and, and watch the movie. I'm like, this this was suppressed. This was a steaming pile of shit. How is this? How is this suppressed? And then there's the chosen. And then there's this film. I'm like, yeah, Angel Studios. This ain't this ain't it, bro. Just yeah, I got I got I got no other words for it. Obviously, having a true masculine depiction of whatever a man of the faith or a feminine depiction of a woman doesn't sell. That's what it's about. It's about asses and seats and tickets. And I'm not even going to bother with this. And neither should anybody else. That nope. I mean that that's it. Steph, I saw Steph um, from downstairs in the chat saying, "Men boycott this film." Mm -hmm. Do not go see it. And and Nick was insinuating as much in the opening 10 minutes. If you're at Franciscan or Ave Maria or Benedictine College, and I, I know how this works. I know very well, right? This is I've been in the trade for, for years now. So at these college towns, they're going to be pushing you hard. Go see this film. Another thing, I'm not sure if these guys invented it, the three amigos, but something they they have adverted to with the sound of freedom as well is you know, pay it forward. Big donors can pay for a hundred tickets of of young people. So so go get a go see it on a free ticket that wasn't actually free. Don't just say no, I don't want to. This is a good shit test for young women that you're considering courting. If they're like, I want to see Cabrini go like. Well, okay, read this review. Look at uh, Thomas Mears' review on Catholic culture. Listen to what these guys said on the CMAS podcast. That's good. You're going to cut through a lot of wasted time. And this could actually be a good thing. It could be one good thing that comes from this terrible, terrible flick is efficiency. Yeah, I mean, you could, you could literally cut through a lot of time and, and say, I'm not going to go see it. And if you went and saw it and liked it, we probably have a major problem. I'm going to print out 150 of Steph's dump her pamphlets yeah. and go stand outside of Cabrini and just hand it to the hangdogged guys coming out going, no, yeah, it was really good. Yeah, no, I really liked it. Uh -huh. Nick, we should literally do this. We should then, literally actually spend our day doing this on opening and just day. Have, just have the... See mask podcast linked at the bottom with a QR code. Like we got you back, bro. We got you. We got you. We got you. And then we can help you date. Go to go to. Uh, we can find your your wife for you. Go yeah. to uh, return by us matchmaking. Matchmaking by return by us match. <laughs> I'm this not just, sure what it's called. Still, <laughs> this just further affirms the work that we're doing, though, guys. Yeah, we no, got to totally. push even harder. We got to yeah. go at them even stronger bold biblical truths in a very unapologetic unfiltered way the way jesus delivered it to uh, the pharisees at the time um it's not a popular message it's not a very profitable message but i don't really care about profit in the same way that i care about truth um so i mean if if, if anything what douses my um flaming hot anger especially when glenn compared it to the godfather um i'm still it's going to take me a whole day to calm down from that by the way it just further further absolutely affirms the work that we're doing with the podcast and individual and individually with our businesses and everything that we got going on. Um, such a lack of this message, man. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's where I'm at. I'm just going to go out and even and stomp the ground even harder. Hey, hey, uh, by way of closing, I want each of you to deliver a closing statement, respond to either, or if you want both of, of these questions, but, but either one so that we can, cause there were two more questions I wanted to ask and, some of you can respond to one, some the other. Um, first off, by way of closing, it's a parting shot. Movie executives love to use exception to rules to make law out of. Um, they do this to bend moral rules in the universe, the natural law. So the exception to the laws of femininity that we do exist with as Roman Catholics is nuns. Nuns are the, they, nuns are not, it's a very holy lifestyle, but it, they're not traditionally feminine. Um, when we used to go take our girls to see the nuns in Tehachapi, when we lived in Southern California, they're fixing fences, they're milking the goats, they're hauling around lumber, literally, because they live on a convent alone. They're independent, they're 
starting 501c3 type operations like the Rockefellers. And therefore, Hollywood loves them. If you can get rid of the chastity and the absolute obedience before God, a Hollywood exec who's a, an Old Testament purveyor loves this because they know that the, cha the, 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 the prayer, getting up to pray, you know, the hours, the liturgy of the hours, seven times a night doesn't sell. But what does sell is go be an entrepreneur. So they know, I, I mean, I'm answering my own question. I think this is why they love to use exception to normalize bad law. Use a nun to normalize what a bunch of lay women are going to be doing. You're influencing their tastes for the future. Um, that's that's one just sort of prompt. If you had a notion on that, the the other one you could you could comment on in closing. Um, why do boomers still push feminism? It's kind of a big issue. It seems kind of obvious, but I'm what usually when people are losing, they abandon the cause. But, but the boomers are lost causers when it comes to feminism. So I, I know it's kind of an obvious on-the-nose question, but no one ever asks it. So we'll go um, M Mike and then Nick and then Will. Either of those questions. I think with the boomers, I think it's a pride thing. And I think past a certain point, they've just stopped learning and they've just shut their brains off. Most boomers are just NPCs. I mean, look at how they react to younger people and the struggles with home ownership and everything it's like well just work harder back in my day it's a complete disconnect from reality they're just just disconnected from reality and i think that's rooted in in pride refusal to, to to learn and to spiritually grow and all i have to say is an overarching theme is like these executives and everybody that's co-signing this movie and anything like it which is a complete inversion of our faith repent to repent believe the gospel you're going to have to answer for this heresy at one point you know at the end so I mean, repent while you're still here, because I think I think the gates of hell are going to be filled with people like this that that, that push this kind of message because it's so anti-Christ. Agreed, Nick. Films like this <clears throat> demonstrate that you don't need a cabal to unravel the good things and the truth. Well said. It probably was initiated by some kind of cabal, and I'm sure that. Um, that there's some level of architecting, but not, in my opinion, to any meaningful degree. I don't think it makes sense for, because even with the Francis Pontificate and everything that he's saying, um, which was probably a result of the St. Gallen Mafia, as we've discussed at length, or you have discussed, Tim. The actual blueprint for what a Catholic marriage man and woman should be has been lost and there is tacit uncritical acceptance of the lie that cabrini demonstrates that secular catholicism has demonstrated uh, by everybody your mom is going to go see this your girlfriend's going to go see this your grandma's going to go see it they're all you know the husband the boyfriend they're all going to go see it Glenn Beck saw it. He's saying it's like the Godfather. We are doing, we, they are doing Satan's work for him. And so there is no cue. There is no savior besides Christ, but there's no like earthly architect who's going to push back against this. We have to, period. It's literally the power to fathers, power to patriarchs, young men. Um, it's our job. You have to, on an individual level, just start, I hate to say evangelizing because I think evangelizing is, is kind of cringe most of the time, but they don't know. Nobody knows what it's supposed to be unless they're told that that's not a woman. That's a very, very confused female who thinks she's a man. And I just think that because of the lack of education, this is going to, uh, perpetuate itself until it's terminated by people like us and other people who hear our message, understand it and start doing their own F putting their own effort in. Do you think as a director, Nick, this will be embraced or rejected? I'd love it if this were a, a flaming rejection. Um, well, unfortunately the, this, the books are padded with reviews like this and you're already seeing it being front loaded with 
Glenn Beck, Jack Posobiec, people on Twitter who are getting affiliate ticket links, you're all these conservative influencers, the type of people that we talk about on this show who are on the right, but they're still feminists, uh, who are Christian, but they're still feminists. Um, and so these reviews are going to be heavily, heavily weighted in favor and opinions such as ours, you're not really going to hear them much. So I think even if it's not the case that it goes over well, it will appear as though it goes over well. And that typically happens if you look at Rotten Tomatoes. Um, prior to like a super woke film coming out, it has 100% fresh on Rotten Tomatoes because they'll get like 12 to 15 critics to do exactly what Glenn Beck did. And that gets butts in seats. They're like, wow, it's got such great reviews. Let's go see it. And then the audience reviews kind of just get lost. So, yeah. The... The most subversive thing about it, just to pick up on Tim's point, is that a a feminist retelling of a nun's life is being presented to women who have, in almost all cases, uh, no calling to be nuns as the way to live their lives. So it's really confused to present this to them as the model of what a woman is supposed to be when pretty much all women are called to marriage and are going to live lives nothing like what they're seeing in this film is actually damaging. It's not going to help femininity. It won't help masculinity either. And if young guys do what Nick suggests in there, which is see this as like a line in the sand, are you, are you with the movie or are you against it? You have to accept that people's feelings will be hurt, but that's okay. Aquinas says that the virtuous man will sometimes not shrink from bringing sorrow to those among whom he lives. If you have to tell people you don't like this movie and you think it's worth explaining why, go ahead, give the explanation. Maybe they'll learn something and it'll be for their spiritual good. Otherwise, maybe they don't want to hear the explanation. You just say it. And then someone else in your life might have ears to hear and they'll be interested by your example because of other stuff they've listened to you about. And that's just how it has to be. Otherwise, you can cock and say it's great and you're going to harm everyone around you. Monique T said in our comments, I wish that you didn't equate one woman's courage with feminism. I, I wish that the, the Trace Amigos didn't equate feminism with courage. That, that's what I wish. I wish that the three trailers in the first five minutes of the film weren't filled with DEI white guilt uh, uh, about literally what they keep saying, oh, you hate them because they have brown skin. Uh, we, we haven't even talked about that. I wish that um, this film wasn't a 90s boomers dream when it comes to open borders and the deification of immigration. We now know better. I wish that this film didn't have an anti-clerical spirit uh, like like a Hollywood radical liberal that regards the dual patriarchy of Christianity, clerical patriarchy, high one, low one is the household patriarchy of men. I wish it didn't have an anti-clerical spirit. And most off, I wish that it didn't have an anti-man feminism running through every minute of the film. People out there, I mean, if you go see it, you're not going to think, what were those guys talking about? They were seeing something I wasn't seeing. I, I don't, there's not a possibility that if you waste your, your $9 or $11 or whatever it is going to see this film, you're going to disagree with me. You're either a, a proper feminist simplicitaire who, who calls themselves a Christian. And you're just like, well, yeah, it was feminist and I loved it. It was a great feminist screenplay, which the director said. And I, and I like that. Or you're gonna you're gonna sound like it, it half as you know maybe maybe not quite as angry as Mike uh, in Beck's <laughs> comparison to Godfather, but you're gonna sound angry like us, and th there's no in between. There's gonna be zero folks who see Cabrini that are like I didn't see the feminism, I didn't see the angle. That that happens a lot because normies miss stuff. I, you, IQ 95s and IQ hundreds miss things. There will be no one in any walk of life that misses the feminism in this film. So what I'm urging you, particularly if you're a self-respecting man, is just don't see it. 
don't don't waste your time. But if you do see it, then I promise you one thing. You're either a feminist or not. This will be the tell. So it is kind of a, a good shit test. Uh, men for women, women for men. If you see this film and you liked it, we have a problem. You know, like Glenn Beck, you know, the, the open borders, Zionist, feminist, dispensationalist, boomer Glenn Beck. Who's in? I don't know. I don't know if he. I don't know what his connection is with Angel Studios, but it's 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 a Mormon thing. I don't know if it's Mormon mafia or what. I, I don't. I don't claim to know. I'm not claiming to know. I don't know why he's shilling this film. But you got some Catholics working together with some Mormons to produce a very feminist product, and I, I hope I hope we have uh, steered people in the right direction today. Let me know in the comments. I'm very curious. And if you got an early viewing yourself or, or, or something like that, or you go see it today and you're only watching this review afterwards, let us know how we did. We'll, Gentlemen, we'll just throw one last thing, Mike. I know you got to go. <clears throat> we were asking, what can we do? When does it end? And Tim, you asked how, how will this be received? It's reported that this film took $50 million to make. That's a lot of money. Tim and I have some understanding about how films get funded, where money goes, where it comes from, stuff like this. I will tell you that it will be very hard to make another Cabrini if this film makes $10 million, unlike Sound of Freedom, which was funded for $11 million and made $231 million. So I think boycotts are kind of gay. I always cringe when conservatives are like, boycott this bean company or whatever it is that they talk about. All I'm saying is that if this sentiment is spread far and wide and they don't make 2x on that 50 million, you're probably not going to see another Cabrini. So share this video. Amen. That was the uh, the most fun I've ever had reviewing a film I haven't watched. So <laughs> same, same same here. <laughs> you have watched the trailer though. That's that's good. That's enough. all we need. Yeah, that's it. Good I'm not going to watch it either. Yeah. It'd be bad for my soul. Yeah, it would. I love all of your souls. God bless you guys. Have an excellent Friday. I don't know what Nick's bean company analogy meant. Are you saying to boycott it or not? I say I say boycott. No, what are you saying? Go Goya beans, they said, like, I don't know, the left tried to boycott Goya beans because Trump said he, I don't know. I was just saying, oh, yes, bo boycott the film. I just think that boycotts typically are cringe, but if we boycott this film, then it will actually not do well. Nobody will. They won't make another one. Yeah. But are you? Yeah. No, I, I get you. I get you now. Well, treat it like beans. Boys. I'll, treat uh, it like beans. I'll catch you guys next week. God Love bless. You, all you dudes. God bless you guys. Take, Take, care. Days Take care, guys.